You've survived another week. Thank you for listening, downloading, and supporting the Black Man with a Gun Show podcast. This week, history, the Indian Wars. We've been tearing up the Americans' Indians for a long time. You want to hear how long in a little bit. Talk about confrontational politics. This is kind of an add-on from last week. Just some inside stuff, some ideological stuff to get the gun rights activists among us thinking. I'm going to peel back the curtain just a tad to just tell you some stuff that I've learned over time and a little bit about myself for the new folks who are listening. Are you ready? Well, all right then. Blackmanwithagun.com Ken Blanchard's Pro-Gun Podcast. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation under God indivisible with liberty and justice for all if you're a long time listener you probably have forgot some of the stuff that I've gone through and I every once in a while I need to go back and just think about it myself to get a perspective of where I'm at and where I've been if you're new to the show you might not know that I actually started some of this stuff back in 1990. Started a training business, a firearms training business. I was teaching civilians, um, security guards, and trying to be able to qualify Maryland State Police, D.C. Metropolitan Police, and Virginia officers that needed to be recalled. So I had a boatload of certifications and training to allow me to do that. In 1990. Somewhere around there. I also um, paid some good money, spent a lot of money in overhead and training facility that I owned right next to a range and learned some hard lessons about business. Tried to restructure it around 91. Got involved with the National Rifle Association for the first time. Um, I was a little apprehensive because I'd heard all the negative stuff about black people in NRA and what they don't do and all that good stuff. And was pleasantly surprised, learned a lot about myself, got involved in gun rights, got a chance to um, get used as uh, the black guy for concealed carry reform across the country. Actually worked um, part time on call, on contract. They paid for me to go to about five or six different states where I testified in front of the legislatures and earned my bones in the media. Started a gun club that became National Gun Club, but I wasn't ready for that yet in 1992, somewhere about, called the 10th Cavalry Gun Club. I was the man on the street learning about people, actually. Wasn't really ready for all that. I was just trying to be a business person, trying to get out of the good government job that I had. All this was before Google, before social media. Got some media training. But it didn't prepare me for the hand-to-hand stuff that you get on radio and television back then, talk shows. And if I was a quicker learner, if I was better prepared, which I don't think I could have changed anything, I'd been more prominent, I believe. I published a website um, with the help of my intelligence community friends. They built a website that was so big, the NRA was like, wow. At the time, it was bigger than theirs. Called Black Man with a Gun. Wrote a book and tried to use that website because that was the new thing back when AOL 1.0 was out to advertise that I had a book. And that book was Black Man with a Gun. The Responsible Gun Owner's Manual for African Americans. And uh, it was a book that black bookstores didn't want to sell. Oprah had looked at it and turned it back in and said it's not something that she wanted to um, promote her exact words. Not been a fan of Oprah ever since. Um, Trying to market that book proved to be pretty tough. Had to fight stereotypes um, both in the church and in the family. And I was just getting back into the family, actually. I'd been pretty much a rogue guy my whole life. Left home at 17, had no intention on coming back. 
But here I was. I learned a lot about me over the last 25 years. Got a divorce in there. Got remarried. uh, Fought bankruptcy. New family, new baby. Had some big money woes in there. Learned a lot. Traveled around the country trying to make news and be responsible. Responding to uh, invitations to speak, which was my thing. I wanted to be a great speaker. Again, before TEDx and all that good stuff. Was chasing the gun rights organizations that would gladly put my face on something like the Second Amendment Foundation. Um, But I wasted a lot of time doing that, to be honest. I chased a lot of influencers. Didn't really get any help. I got a lot of lip service. And the frustration and the anger grew. Not really blaming anybody else. It's with myself, mostly. Started a podcast because I've always wanted to be in radio in 2007. Seeing and hearing what was going on in the world kind of changes you. I got a chance to be in the midst of newsmakers and politicians and NRA legendary people. Seeing people move ahead, seeing what made them move. Sometimes I didn't even want to be unbothered with what they were doing. Again, feeling stagnated, doubting myself, figuring this is just a one-time shot. It was just going to be over eventually because who cares about the term black man with a gun? Redid the book and got a publisher this time. Spoke at a couple of things. Was starting to get notoriety. I've been around um, a decade already. Still had doubts. Wondered if this thing was going to last. I kept seeing a pattern, and that pattern still exists, actually. I picked gun rights because it's an evergreen subject. If you don't know it or not, it never goes away. I watched um, the growth of podcasting, YouTube. I watched new people come in and out and do pretty well. Seen new blogs and pages like Emma Land and A whole bunch of stuff pop up and go away. KeepingBearArms.com. Bearing arms. I watched um, folks start and do pretty well. Back before uh, 9-11, I sacrificed um, some positions with my job because of gun rights. Gave up a lot of things, actually. Put myself out there, the job that I was doing. Did not want me out there in the public, in the media eye. And I think I don't still don't have was compensated for that pain not that I'm taking count but just talking to you just me and you just talking but over the last 25 years I've been in the background I've vetted people I've actually um, coached people I've gave them encouragement when they started something new and happy when they actually did better than me believe it or not all except for one guy one guy I loathe I think he's like devil incarnate, and that's just wrong. But I get over it. Looking back in summary, I've pretty much grown up in this gun rights community, and I've seen a lot. It's made me wiser. I'm a lot more mellower now than I ever was. I was mellow before, but it was before is because of my job. If you're not getting shot at and trying to make it to an airport to get the heck out of the country, then everything else is pretty, pretty chill. That's my background. That's where I'm coming from. So I can take a lot of stuff. Now the fight is mostly internal. I think now though, if I end up like uh, the Morgan Freeman of gun community, that'd be cool. I used to say I wanted to be the Bill Cosby of the gun community, but that didn't turn out so well. My wife always warns me about trying to use analogies, compare myself to other people to just be me, just be you. So I got to remember that. Well, me is a 57-year-old pastor of an internet church, former CIA firearms instructor and trainer, former U.S. Marine, gun activist named Ken Blanchard. Now I'm missing probably a whole bunch of stuff that I could probably give myself a pat on the back for. But, hey, I'm just Ken with two ends. Not the Ken Blanchard from the One Minute Manager or Gung Ho. That guy, that's the rich guy in California. I'm the poor guy 
right outside the nation's capital. Don't be the only one who doesn't have a copy of Black Man with a Gun Reloaded by Reverend Ken Blanchard. This autobiographic book weaves my life and the struggle of gun rights in America. Black Man with a Gun Reloaded is available on Amazon. Get the book that has a glossary of gun terms. My background as a CIA officer, trainer, and gun rights activist known as the Black Man with a Gun. Get yours now. Go to book.blackmanwithagun.com. On last week's episode, I talked about Coleon Noir and his masterful use of um, debate and staying on point and how as a gun rights activist, you too have to be ready to fight that way. And and just looking back at my life and my fails and stuff that I did wrong, I learned just recently that most of that stuff was hardwired into me. If you identify as a Christian, then you have to know that there's actually some weak spots that are used against us quite often. We're trying to get harmony. We're trying to concede without confrontation. We're trying to give the other person a fair shake. Christianity teaches us that all humans are precious in the eyes of God, and each one is important, blessed with a soul, unique one of God's children. And as God's supreme creation, we have been given dominion over the earth, and that's an awesome responsibility. Most of us don't like confrontation. We don't like uh, arguments. We don't like any of that negative stuff. We want harmony. So when antagonism threatens, compromise is the accepted way to restore peaceful relationships. Giving of oneself, sacrificing in order to reach agreement is deemed noble as long as no commandment is broken. To be polite and considerate of others is good behavior. Am I right? But I have learned, my brother and sister, that this stuff is used against us by people who don't believe what we believe. And they use our meekness as a weakness. All right, now let's look at the other side. They look upon this confrontation as a necessity, a positive ingredient in advancing their program. They expect confrontation. They plan for it and anticipate the predictable, the negative reactions for their oppositions often using the reaction to further promote their cause. Conflict, therefore, is expected, welcomed, analyzed, and then used to advance their goals. Momentum is obviously on the side of the aggressors since they have the tactical advantage of initiating the attack. And before their intended opposition even knows a clash will occur, they have had the opportunity to plan, strategize, organize, and select the field of battle, choose the time, and launch that program, and to frame the issue in such a manner as to put their program in the best light. I have been on television shows, documentaries, where the thing was stacked against you. And the best that you could do was to hold the line. And after you do the best you can do, if you did really, really well, they would edit out your section. And your half an hour might be 30 seconds. We got to stop using the word compromise when we're talking to the other side. Because they're not giving us anything. In case you didn't hear me before, we're not out to rewrite our U.S. Constitution, abandon our freedoms, or force our ideas on anyone, but they are. We Americans like the way our forefathers put this nation together. And now before my brothers and sisters of color get all mad and twisted at me, let me let you know that I understand where we come from. I ain't skirting that issue at all. But political dissertations back in the day were filled with religious quotations. The Bible was used as an authoritative and powerful document when proving a political point. Now, we can fight about religion, too. That it was not our God, was not our religion, that was forced and used against us. But I'll do that another time. I don't pray to a blue-eyed, blonde-haired Jesus, by the way. Now that I got your attention, let me get back to what I'm saying. One of my favorite old European dudes was the 81-year-old Ben Franklin, who, at the Constitutional Convention, stated the following to the assembled delegates. He said, I have lived, sirs, a long time, and the longer I've lived, the more convincing proofs I have seen of this truth that God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, it is probable that the empire can rise without his aid. We have assured, sirs, in the sacred writings, that except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain that build it. Now, that was just cool. And then in the beginning of the so-called enlightened 20th century, the rumblings of humanism could be heard. Uh, President Theodore Roosevelt stated, 
There are those who believe that a new modernity demands a new morality. He said there's only one morality. There's only one true Christian ethic over against which stands the whole of paganism. If we are to fulfill our great destiny as a people, he said, then we must return to the old morality, the soul morality. He also said, all these blatant sham reformers in the name of a new morality preach the old, old vice and self-indulgence, which rotted out first the moral fiber and then even the external greatness of Greece and Rome. Having lived under the arbitrary power of the English Parliament and under the foot of Imperial King George III, our forefathers realized the necessity to limit the power of man and government in perpetuity. So, to do so, they drafted a document limiting government authority, restricting and confining the powers of the central government. The public concern for liberty demanded even more guarantees of freedom, and the Bill of Rights was soon forthcoming. The writers of the Constitution wisely did not want too much authority residing in the hands of a fallible man, nor did they desire his errors to be codified into law. So these old dead white guys, recognizing one's shortcoming, to not be a blowhard was to be respected. To be a social media whore, in a better word, was to be avoided. Ken, what are you trying to say? What I'm trying to say is right now, with all the gun control stuff that you are hearing, it's time for us to start thinking and asking the right questions. You know, the average one of us tends to see the participants in all these causes as well-meaning folks trying to do some good. But the truth is they're not disjointed. They're all connected to the government side, to the political machine that's trying to take away our rights. Not just the Second Amendment, but all of them. And they'll settle for one piece at a time. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, friends, and even my enemies. There can be no compromises with the left. We are ideologically at opposite ends of the spectrum with no arbitration possible. Either they win or we do. They will run the government or we will. That's the only choice open to either of us. They know it. Shouldn't we? Being an armed citizen means having a gun with you all the time. Carrying a firearm every day requires a holster that is both concealable and comfortable. Whether you choose our Super Tuck Deluxe or Mini Tuck, you'll have the confidence that comes from being discreetly and comfortably armed, prepared to face unforeseen dangers. Crossbreed holsters are handmade in the USA, come with a lifetime warranty and a two-week try-it-free guarantee. Order your holster today at CrossbreedHolsters.com. You know, this week I want to talk about the Native American people, the Native indigenous folks whose names are on street signs and highway signs and town signs. And we don't even know what happened or who they are. This is going to be a, a scan of thousands of years, actually. But I want to try just to give a overview of some of the stuff that's happened in this nation. And we're going to go way back. You know, warfare between Europeans and Indians was common in the 17th century. In 1622, the Powhatan Confederacy nearly wiped out the struggling Jamestown colony. If you're around the Richmond area, you'll see signs that say Po White Parkway. That's where that comes from, the Powhatan. Frustrated at the continuing conflicts, Nathaniel Bacon and a group of vigilantes destroyed the Pamunkey Indians before leading an unsuccessful revolt against colonial authorities in 1676. The Pamunkey Indians, there's a couple of spots in Maryland called Pamunkey. Intermediate warfare also plagued early Dutch colonies in New York. In New England, Puritan forces annihilated the Pequots. In 1636 and 1637, a campaign whose intensity seemed to foreshadow the future. Subsequent attacks inspired by Metacon, also known as King Philip, against English settlements, sparked a concerted response from the New England Confederation, employing Indian auxiliaries and scorched earth policy. The colonists nearly exterminated the Nagaransets, the Wampanoags, and the Nipmucks in 1675 and 1676. 
A major Pueblo revolt also threatened Spanish-held New Mexico in 1680. Did you know, on November 29th, 1864, one of the most infamous events of the American Indian Wars occurred when 650 Colorado volunteer forces attacked a Cheyenne and Arapaho encampment along Sand Creek. Although they had already begun to peace negotiations with the U.S. Um, government, more than 150 Native Americans were killed and mutilated, more than two-thirds of which were women and children. That's a whole lot of murdering, isn't it? Native people were also a key factor in the imperial rivalries among France, Spain, and England. In King William's 1689-1697, to Queen Anne's 1702-1713, to and King George's 1744-1748 to wars, the French sponsored Abnaki and Mohawk raids against the more numerous English. Meanwhile, the English and their trading partners, the Chickasaws and often the Cherokees, battled the French and associated tribes for control of the lower Mississippi River, the Valley, and the Spanish in western Florida. More decisive was the French and Indian War that happened in 1754 to 1763. The French and their Indian allies dominated the conflict's early stages, turning back several English columns to the north. Particularly serious was the near annihilation of General Edward Braddock's force of 1,300 men outside of Fort Duskine in 1755. But with English minister William Pitt infusing new life into the war effort, British regulars and provincial militias overwhelmed the French and absorbed all of Canada. But 18th century conflicts were not limited to the European wars for empire. In Virginia and the Carolinas, English-speaking colonists pushed aside the Tuscaroas, the Yamanses, and the Cherokees. The Natchez, Chickasaw, and Fox Indians resisted French domination, and the Apaches and Comanches fought against Spanish expansion in Texas. Now, some of these names you only hear in the John Wayne movie, right? I know. In 1763, an Ottawa chief, Pontiac, forged a powerful confederation against British expansion into the Old Northwest. Although his raids wreaked havoc upon the surrounding white settlements, the British victory in the French and Indian War, combined with the Proclamation of 1763, which forbade settlement west of the Appalachian Mountains, soon eroded Pontiac's support. Most of the Indians east of the Mississippi River now perceived the colonial pioneers as a greater threat than the British government. Thus, northern tribes, especially those influenced by Mohawk chief Tyenda Nanega, also known as Joseph Brandt. Now I'm about to like say that again. Tyenda Nanega. I think that was better. He generally sided with the crown during the American War for independence. In 1777, they joined the Tories and the British in the unsuccessful offenses of John Burgoyne and Barry St. Laguerre in upstate New York. Western uh, Pennsylvania and New York became savage battlegrounds as the conflict spread to the Wyoming and Cherry Valleys. Strong American forces finally penetrated the heart of Iroquois territory, leaving a wide swath of destruction in their wake. In the Midwest, George Rogers Clark captured strategic Vincennes uh, for the Americans, but British agents based at Detroit continued to sponsor Tory and Indian forays as far south as Kentucky. The Americans resumed the initiative in 1782 when Clark marched northwest into Shawnee and Delaware country, ransacking villages and inflicting several stinging defeats upon the Indians. To the south, the British backed resistance among the Cherokees, Chickasaws, Creeks, and Choctaws, but quickly forgot their former allies following the signing of the Treaty of Paris in 1783. By setting the boundaries of the newly recognized United States at the Mississippi River and the Great Lakes, that treaty virtually ensured future conflicts between whites and resident tribes. In 1790, Miami Chief Little Turtle routed several hundred men led by Josiah Hamer along with the Maumee River. Author St. Clair's column suffered even more defeat at the Wabash River of the following year. Only in 1794 did Anthony Wayne gain revenge at the Battle of Fallen Timbers, yet resistance to white expansion in the Old Northwest continued as the Shawnee chief Tecumseh molded a large Indian co confederation based at Prophetstown. While Tecumseh was away seeking additional support, William Henry Harrison burned the village after a stalemate in 
at the Battle of Tippecanoe in 1811. Indian raids, often encouraged by the British, were influential in causing the United States to declare war on Great Britain in 1812. The British made Tecumseh a brigadier general and used Indian allies to help recapture Detroit and Fort Dearborn, later called Chicago. Several hundred American prisoners were killed following a skirmish at the River Raisin in early 1813. But Harrison pushed into Canada and won the Battle of the Thames, which saw the death of Tecumseh and the collapse of his confederation. In the southeast, the Creeks gained a major triumph against American forces at Fort Sims, killing many of their prisoners in the process. Andrew Jackson led the counterthrust, winning victories at Tallahatchie and Talladega before crushing the Creeks at Horseshoe Bend in 1814. Alaska and Florida were also the scenes of bitter conflicts. Native people strongly contested the Russian occupation of Alaska. The Aleuts were defeated during the 18th century, but the Russians found it impossible to prevent uh, legit harassment of their hunting parties and trading posts. Upon the Spanish secession of Florida, Washington began removing the territory's tribes to lands west of the Mississippi River, but the Seminole Indians and runaway slaves refused to relocate, and the Second Seminole War saw fierce guerrilla-style actions from 1835 to 1842. Osceola, perhaps the greatest Seminole leader, was captured during peace talks in 1837, and nearly 3,000 Seminoles were eventually removed. The Third Seminole War, 1855 to 1858, stamped out all but a handful of remaining members of the tribe. In the United States, the po removal policy met only sporadic armed resistance as whites pushed into the Mississippi River Valley during the 1830s and 1840s. The Sac and Fox Indians were crushed in Black Hawk's War, 1831 to 1832. The tribes throughout the region seemed powerless in the face of the growing numbers of forts and military roads the whites were constructing. The acquisition of Texas in the Southwest during the 1840s sparked a new series of Indian white conflicts. In Texas, where such warfare had marred the independent republic brief history, the situation was especially volatile. On the Pacific coast, attacks against the native people accompanied the flood of immigrants to gold-laden California. Disease, malnutrition, and warfare, combined with the poor lands set aside as reservations to reduce the Indian population of that state from 150,000 in 1845 to 34, through 35,000 in 1860. The Army took the lead role in Oregon and Washington, used the Rogue River, 1855 to 1856, Yakima, 1855 to 1856, and Spokane, 1858 wars to force several tribes on two reservations. Sporadic conflicts also plagued Arizona and New Mexico throughout the 1850s as the Army struggled to establish its presence. On the southern plains, mounted warriors posed an even formidable challenge to white expansion. Strikes against the Sioux, Cheyennes, Arapaho, Comanches, and Kiowas during the decade only hinted at deadlier conflicts of years to come. The Civil War saw the removal of the regulars and the company increase in the number of intensity of white Indian conflicts. The influence of the five southern, or quote, civilized tribes of the Indian Territory was sharply reduced. Several Indian regiments served with Confederate troops at the Battle of Pea Ridge in 1862. Defeat there at Honey Springs in 1863 dampened enthusiasm for the South, although tribal leaders like Stan Waite continued to support the Confederacy until the war's end. James H. Carlton and Christopher Kit Carson conducted a ruthless, effective campaign against the Navajos in New Mexico and Arizona. Disputes on the Southern Plains culminated in the Sand Creek Massacre in 1864, during which John M. Chivington's Colorado's volunteers slaughtered over 200 of Black Kettles, Cheyenne, and Arapahoes, many of whom had attempted to come to terms with the government. In Minnesota, Attacks by the Eastern Sioux prompted counterattacks by the volunteer forces of Henry H. Sibley, after which the tribes were removed to the Dakotas. The conflict became general when John Pope mounted a series of unsuccessful expeditions into the plains, 
in 1865. Regular units, including four regiments of black troops, returned west following the Confederate collapse, railroad expansion, new mining ventures, destruction of the buffalo, and ever-increasing white demand for land, exacerbating in centuries-old tensions. The mounted warriors of the Great Plains posed an especially thorny problem for an army plagued by a chronic shortage of cavalry and a government policy that demanded Indian removal on the cheap. Winfield S. Hancock's ineffective campaign in 1867 merely highlighted the bitterness between whites and Indians on the southern plains. Using a series of converging columns, Philip Sheridan achieved more success in his winter campaigns of 1868-1869, to but only when the Red River War of 1874 and 75 were the tribes broken. Major battlefield encounters like George Armstrong Custer's triumph at the Battle of Washita in 1868 had been rare. More telling was the Army's destruction of Indian lodges, horses, and food supplies, exemplified by Raynal McKenzie's slaughter of over a thousand Indian ponies following a skirmish at Palo Duro Canyon in Texas. 1874. To the north, the Sioux, Northern Cheyennes, and the Arapahoes were forced the army to abandon its Bozeman Trail forts in Red Cloud's War in 1867. But arable lands and rumors of gold in the Dakotas continued to attract white migration. The government opened a major new war in 1876. Initial failures against a loose Indian coalition forged by leaders including Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull culminating into the annihilation of five troops of Custer's cavalry at the Little Bighorn. A series of army columns took the field that fall and again the following spring. By campaigning through much of the winter, harassing Indian villages and winning battles like that of Wolf Mountain, 1877, Nelson A. Miles proved particularly effective. The tribes had to sue for peace, and even Sitting Bull's band returned from Canada to accept reservation life in 1881. Another outbreak among the Sioux and Northern Cheyennes, precipitated by government corruption, shrinking reservations, and the spread of the ghost dance, culminating in a grisly encounter at Wounded Knee in 1890, in which the casualties totaled over 200 Indians and 64 soldiers. I think I said that in episode number 625. Less spectacular but equally deadly were conflicts in the Pacific Northwest. In 1867 to 1868, George Crook defeated the Paiutes of Northern California and Southern Oregon in a desperate effort to secure a new reservation on tribal homelands. A Modoc chief assassinated Edward R.S. Canby during an abortive peace conference in 1873. Canby's death, and he was the only general ever killed by Indians, helped shatter President Ulysses S. Grant's peace policy and resulted in the tribe's defeat and removal. Refusing life on a government-selected reservation, Chief Joseph Nez Perses led the army on an epic 1,700-mile chase through Idaho, Wyoming, and Montana until checked by miles just short of the Canadian border at Bear Paw Mountain in 1877. Also unsuccessful was armed resistance among the Banucks, the Paiutes, the Sheep Eaters, and the Utes in 1878 and 1879. To the far southwest, Cochise, Victorio, and Geronimo led various Apache bands in resisting white and Hispanic encroachments, crossing and recrossing the border into Mexico with seeming impunity. Many an officer's record was scarred as repeated treaties proved abortive. Only after lengthy campaigning, during which army columns frequently entered Mexico, were the Apaches forced to surrender in the mid-1880s. The army remained wary of potential trouble as incident violence continued, yet with the exception of another clash in 1973, during which protesters temporarily seized control of Wounded Knee, the major Indian white conflicts in the United States had ended. Primarily and militarily, several trends had become apparent. New technology gave the whites a temporary advantage, but this edge was not universal. Indian warriors carrying repeating weapons during the latter 19th century sometimes outgunned their army opponents, who were equipped with cheaper, but often more reliable, single-shot carbines and rifles. As the scene shifted from the eastern woodlands to the western plains, white armies found it increasingly difficult to initiate fights with their Indian rivals. To force action, army columns converged upon Indian villages from several directions. 
this dangerous tactic had worked well at the Battle of Washita, but could produce disastrous results when large numbers of tribesmen chose to stand and fight, as at Little Bighorn. Throughout the centuries of conflict, both sides had taken the wars to the enemy populace, and the conflicts had exacted a heavy toll among non-combatants. Whites had been particularly effective in exploiting tribal rivalries. Indeed, Indian scouts and auxiliaries were often essential in defeating tribes deemed hostile by white governments. In the end, however, military force alone had not destroyed Indian resistance. Only in conjunction with railroad expansion, the destruction of the buffalo, increased numbers of non-Indian settlers, and the determination of successful governments to crush any challenge to their sovereignty had white armies overwhelm the tribes. And this was poached from The Reader's Companion to American History, published in 1991. This show is sponsored by Band of Brothers. Are you a member of the band? You can join us at patreon.com forward slash black man with a gun. From this day to the ending of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. You know, Shakespeare wrote that in 1598. That was from Henry V. I'm asking you to personally support this podcast and the blog on patreon.com forward slash black man with a gun. And if you join, I got a patch for you and a coffee mug with the black man with a gun logo. But the mug is for the top shooting supporters. For more details, check out patreon.com forward slash black man with a gun. Well, all right, that's it for this week. I want to thank you for listening. I'm hoping that I said something that made sense and that uh, you learned something. Feel free to contact me if you need to. Blackmanwithagun at gmail.com. Check out the links on the show notes for our affiliates and click on something just so they know that uh, I'm doing my due diligence. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, showing the people who support us. And just thank you so much for being here. Just in case I don't see you anytime soon. Remember, I love you. And it's not a damn thing you can do about it. Until next time. Shalom, baby. Until next time, friends. To keep in touch with Ken and his cause, head over to blackmanwithagun.com. 